this series of videos I'm repairing and restoring two HB 9100B calculators. So far in this series I've stripped one of the units completely down to bare bones and I've uh, been cleaning up the chassis uh, but before I started reassembling this I wanted to just uh, check the main ROM board which is what we're looking at here. And um, in the previous video we had a quick look at this I explained uh, fairly briefly how it works uh, and then from that point on what I did was to start testing the uh, main core part of this assembly which is this centre gold section 16 layer board and um, the main thing here is it's not repairable really so I needed to make sure that this was all intact now, using a multimeter as far as I can tell all the tracks are intact on this board and so I went on and started checking the uh, the two sense amplifier boards uh, essentially this is just um, 32 identical circuits each one's fairly simple it's just a, a small transformer feeding data from the sense lines of the core out into a small transistor uh, amplifier um, the it's slightly complicated because the uh, each amplifier needs enable lines and uh, that's so that the system can enable and disable the sense lines as it needs to uh, we then have uh, the drivers of course to drive the drive lines and uh, looking through this um, I couldn't find anything wrong um, as far as conductivity is concerned through the core section that doesn't mean it's all intact um, but as far as I can tell it seems okay slightly complicated in as much as although you can't really see them there's a series of small um, ferrite core transformers uh, just under this section between the memory part of the board and the sense amplifier and that's how the data is uh, interfaced it's uh, indu inductively coupled to the sense amplifier uh, they all measure okay you can't really see them that well and uh, changing anything there would be extremely difficult because these are not plugged together they're soldered together and if you try and separate them you probably end up damaging something uh, also under here we've got the steering diodes big bank of diodes and uh, this is 16 by 32 array and uh, these are to allow uh, individual or group enabling of the various lines uh, but I also found uh, a surprising number of very poor joints I even found some joints that uh, were not soldered at all so this particular joint was not soldered at all so I cleaned it and soldered it and there were quite a few joints probably upwards of 50 joints that looked like this may not look too bad but these are cracked so chances are they would be uh, intermittent or open circuit uh, and then I found um, probably 10-15 joints like this and there's a blob of solder on there but it's not actually soldered to the pad so removing the solder from the lead uh, results in this and as you can see there's just corrosion and dirt and muck down in the hole and that again will cause intermittent operation this is a, a current uh, driven system so uh, resistive um, connections do cause a big problem and uh, so what I do is clean uh, the, the hole out uh, with a bit of IPA so it looks like this and then I resolder it and uh, clean all the flux off and we end up with this okay so I did that with all the joints that looked poor and now as far as I can tell uh, all the joints are fine you can't tell 100% of course but certainly there was uh, quite a few joints on here that almost certainly would have been causing problems uh, I then move on to the edge connectors and uh, being careful not to use anything abrasive they are um, hard gold plated and uh, so they just need cleaning rather than anything uh, abrading and it is surprising they might look clean but just cleaning a single one you get a lot of dirt coming off it this is not the solder mask uh, this is the dirt off the actual uh, pins or, or pads themselves and uh, you get this off each of them and it's just a very thin coating of um, dirt and muck and debris, debris and a bit of corrosion from the impurities that were in the gold and it can cause the uh, terminals or contacts to develop fairly high resistance which again in a system like this will cause a big headache so I've gone as far as I can with this the next thing will be to uh, actually start testing it Going uh, a current loop down here but we'll do that once it's all back together again I have um, used the meter to check all the 
capacitors on this, or at least all the uh, tantalum caps, and they all seem fine. So I'll put this back together, and we'll get the chassis back on the bench, and um, we'll start the reassembly process. We're now at the point where I can start rebuilding it, but the first task before I can really get into that is to replace these feet with some that are more in keeping with the originals. I'm not sure why these feet were fitted. I think they look awful. Um, it raised it further off the bench, of course, but um, they really do not look right on this calculator, so I'm going to replace them. Uh, unfortunately, they are quite difficult to get off. Uh, whoever attached these did a very good job of it. I've done one so far, and uh, actually looks like these are the bottom of a walking stick or a Zimmer frame or something like that. Um, but uh, getting them off is quite uh, an ordeal. The way they've been attached is a bolt was passed through the um, chassis from the inside, a nut was put on the outside so that this was essentially bolted through like this, and then the uh, rubber foot was epoxied onto the bolt. So you can't just unscrew it, the whole thing's bonded in place. Uh, as you can see I've done one and the idea is that um, I'll replace that with one of these feet, uh, a foot that looks more as it should. But of course before I can do that I need to get the other three off. But if I try and get this off you can see the problem. Um, it's just solid epoxy and um, it's been there for probably 30, 40, 50 years, who knows, um, and it is extremely difficult to get off. So, uh, as I say, I've done one, got three more to do, so I'll get those three removed, and then we can actually get on with the uh, process of starting the rebuild. As you can see, I've replaced the feet, and these do look much better, They're more in keeping with what would have originally been fitted. And I've also cleaned the entire chassis. Let's flip this over. And as you can see, it's come up very nice and clean. No real corrosion on this. There was uh, some more glue and dirt and muck in this, but it's cleaned it really well. Uh, no paint missing, a few minor scuffs on the bottom, but uh, other than that, it's looking uh, extremely good. So the next step in reassembly is to uh, look at the power supply. So what I'm going to do is work my way through each assembly and then as we get each assembly fully tested and we have some confidence it's doing what it's supposed to, uh, we'll refit it to the uh, chassis, build the machine back up and then what we'll do at the end is uh, when it's all fully assembled we'll start testing it and then fault finding and trying to trace any remaining issues. So next step is to get the power supply and we'll start seeing if that uh, needs any attention. Okay, so uh, no, these aren't the power supply, of course. Uh, these are actually the deflection boards and uh, there's one for horizontal deflection and one for vertical deflection. The CRT used in this machine is an electrostatic deflection tube and so there are no deflection coils. It uses a couple of um, pairs of plates within the tube itself to create an electrostatic field that is used to deflect the electron beam and scan the tube. Uh, this machine, it doesn't have a raster display on the CRT, it uses vector display. And so um, while I was going through the power supply, I did find an issue. You will have noticed that in the earlier videos there was some distortion on the display and the display is synchronized to the mains frequency so it won't have been due to um, any distortion through the mains other than fixed distortion which should have been taken care of within the uh, overall behavior of the scanning circuits and uh, as I went through the power supply I suspected there was a fault in there and sure enough I found an issue which we'll look at in the next video but I uh, just wanted to uh, go through these boards to explain uh, why the power supply can cause distortion on the display. So um, I mentioned before that some of the circuits in this machine are uh, very interesting and uh, these two boards are no exception. They're described in the service manual as logic to analog converters 
and they are both fairly similar. You'll notice that the uh, horizontal board, which is the one at the top here, is slightly more complicated than the vertical. Uh, there's some extra uh, transistors on it, and we'll have a look at why that is in a few minutes. Um, but the way these work is they uh, take a fairly high voltage, it's about 220 volts that's required for the electrostatic deflection. It's actually quite a low voltage uh, compared to uh, voltages that you quite often find in that type of deflection tube. Um, but even so, you need to have a circuit to take the logic level, albeit uh, fairly unusual logic levels in this machine, and control these 220 volt signals. Uh, but uh, the clever part here is the way that these boards actually control the vector uh, drawing on the CRT. There are only really two lines um, that are used to do the basic vector drawing. And um, I thought in this video uh, what I would do is just make a mock-up, as I have done in some of the other circuits, as to uh, how these work. Um, but before we do that, we'll have a quick look at the schematic and I'll try to explain the way that these uh, circuits operate. So there's two schematics of course because they are different boards, fairly similar, but before we look at these we'll explain how the characters are ac actually generated. Okay so if you look at the way in which it goes about drawing the characters, if we s say that this is our template for our seven segment character footprint, and for argument's sake, let's say we want to draw a 9. So it will draw a 9 by turning on and drawing this set of segments. So it will start off coming from the previous segment, and it will start off at the top right-hand corner. So it will come across with the beam off, get up to the top right-hand corner. It will then turn the beam on, and it will move the beam down and draw this uh, segment. It will move down once more and draw the next segment down. It will then turn the beam off and it will go up to the top left hand corner. It will then move across with the beam off. It will turn the beam on, move back across. Next step is it will turn the beam on and move down. It'll turn the beam off, move across, turn the beam on, move back. In this case it will turn the beam off to create this uh, blank section. It will come down to this point. It will move across with the beam still off. It will turn the beam on, move back, and then it will turn the beam off and it will move to the next um, character and draw that. So that's how it goes about drawing this. It looks quite complex and the reason it goes through in this kind of weird order is it best suits um, the way it can draw uh, each of the required characters. There are some complications in this and this is one of the reasons why the horizontal amplifier uh, and output board is more complex than the vertical. Um, firstly there is a, a secondary part of this, it obviously draws uh, multiple lines on the screen and because of the way that the character generation works um, it needs to be able to put in step offsets in order to draw the separate lines. And so there's a separate um, summing amplifier on the board that enables step inputs on top of the character drawing values to be superimposed on the output voltage. Um, and for the horizontal, it also needs to be able to move from character to character, um, but it also needs to be able to move a half character width. And the reason it does that is we might want to draw a one and if we didn't move half a character width, then let's assume we were going to write the number 918. If this is where this character would normally sit, if we just use either this section for the 1, or this section, you can see that it, you get a small gap and a big gap, or a big gap and a small gap. So instead it has the ability to move a half a segment width, and then it can draw the 1, and that puts the 1 um, in the center of the space. So for all this to work, um, the waveforms required are fairly complex. The service manual just does show these. So for example, the one we've just looked at, these are the waveforms generated for the X and the Y um, uh, boards to 
create the scan pattern that we want. But if we look at the schematic, so I don't know how well you'll be able to see this. This is the schematic for the vertical scan board. And it's fairly straightforward in the way that it works. And uh, there are two different sections. There's a, uh, what they call a register separation um, generator. And then there's the character generator. And the register is used to create these offsets for each line. And then the character generator, bear in mind this is just for the vertical deflection, creates the movements required to create the character within each register. Uh, but notice there are only two uh, inputs for this and two inputs for the top, even though it's doing a fairly complex thing here. And the way this works, it's based around a single capacitor. And these are the large capacitors we have on the left of the board. And uh, all the system does is it charges or discharges the capacitor. So it has the ability to put a short pulse onto the um, either the bottom transistor, which will uh, discharge the capacitor, kind of resets the output to, to zero, uh, or it can momentarily turn on the top transistor. And what that does, it uh, enables current to flow through this transistor and that in turn starts to charge up the capacitor and it will charge it up by an amount that's dependent on the setting of this pot and how long the pulse is. And so this pot is just used to control the character height by determining how much the capacitor will charge for each segment. So if you put it, uh, if you turn the transistor on once you'll get a one segment step. So it will move for example from here to here if you then turn it on again, it will move from here to here. And if you turn on the zero um, transistor, it will move it back to the start. There's the same thing with the register uh, offset, exactly the same principle. It just moves um, from one row to the next. And then you have this summing amplifier and it just adds these two together and turns this into a high voltage deflection. And this is kind of where the issue was. The problem on the power supply is in the high voltage smoothing for the 220 volt rail. And we'll look at that in the, the next video. The horizontal amplifier is very similar. The only real difference here is that it has a couple of uh, additional control values. Uh, one is to enable the uh, width of the display to be varied for floating point display. So if you look at the way the uh, calculator works, and we'll come back to this in a later video, then um, if you turn floating point on, you notice that the display gets a lot wider, and that's what this is for. Uh, and also there is a, a partial offset for the uh, figure one. So if it's drawn at one, then it can move by half a, um, a segment width in addition to the character offset that it's already um, selected by moving to the, the, the current character and that's what this bottom uh, transistor does it just puts an additional small half segment width step and then again a summing amplifier uh, adds these two together and gives you the uh, required deflection okay so very straightforward very simple very ingenious requires very few bits and that's what's important with this machine because of the uh, discrete nature we can't spare lots of bits to uh, have uh, D2As or something like that. So this will give you an almost unlimited number of steps um, across the display without the need for additional bits. Uh, and also it's a very efficient way to draw the, uh, the characters. So what I'll do is I'll mock up a very simple version of this circuit and we'll see it's uh, working in a, a simplified format. Okay, I've got a simplified version of the circuit here. This is just um, the reset and the stepping part of the circuit. And um, I've also got a fairly large capacitor in here so I can show you this kind of slow down. Um, but it works the same way. I've got it on a 12 volt supply, so it'll only give us a 12 volts uh, output. And at the moment I have the uh, return to zero uh, enabled. I'm feeding this with a series of um, three millisecond pulses from the signal generator and it's powered up and you can see that the um, output voltage is high. We're looking at this point here which is the output uh, of this particular uh, stage. 
But if I now enable this by um, removing or disabling the uh, reset to zero, then each time the circuit receives a pulse, you'll see a step change in the output voltage. So I'll do that now. And reset it. So you can see resetting immediately takes it back to zero, which in this case is high. And then when I allow it to start stepping, then each step takes it to a new DC level. And that's how this circuit works. It just allows the system to change the voltage uh, one step at a time using a timed pulse. So it's not very exciting to look at like this. So what I'll do now is I'll take one of our PIC demo boards and I'll just write some very simple code to control these two stages. I've done one for X and one for Y and then we should be able to draw a character on the scope. Okay, so I've got the PIC controller set up to drive the four inputs, two for the X and two for the Y. Um, the controller is really only doing this. I've decided to draw a character nine on the display and um, this is the sequence of vectors that we need to do that. So that's what the um, PIC controller is going to output. And uh, what we're looking to do here, as I say, is uh, draw a nine. So the uh, waveforms we're trying to reproduce are this one and this one. So if I now turn the power on and we do a single shot capture, you notice that the outputs do indeed look very similar to the waveforms that we are seeing in the, um, the service manual. And um, in theory, it should allow us to draw the uh, characters uh, on the display. Um, but of course we can't do it in YT mode, we, we need it to be in XY mode. So if I now switch this to XY, you can see that we are indeed drawing a character 9 on the display along with some background noise. Uh, the noise is just where it's resetting um, and normally you wouldn't be able to see that on the CRT, it would be too dim. And in fact if we turn the brightness down you can see uh, those artifacts disappear. And that's exactly the same as you'll get on the actual CRT on the calculator. If you see an artifacts um, between the characters then chances are you just have the brightness set too high. If we turn the pick off but leave the 12 volts turned on you can see that the, um, the, the beam has effectively moved down to the bottom left corner and if we turn the pick back on you can see it redraws the 9, it's just repeatedly drawing the 9 as a series of vectors. And that's exactly the way that the calculator draws characters. It would then move across, draw the next, draw the next, and when it's finished one register, one line, it will move down to the next line and do exactly the same thing. Okay, well hopefully that's explained how these work. And the issue I was getting on the power supply was distortion in the display. And that was due to um, a fault within the power supply. But I wanted to investigate these deflection circuits and boards before I went too deep into that just to make sure that I was looking at the right thing and uh, chasing the correct fault. Okay, well hopefully you found that interesting. Um, I'm gonna be mocking up a few more of the circuits in this calculator, but in the next video, I want to sort out the power supply and start the proper reassembly of the top part of the machine.